The following thoughts on Happy Hour do not represent Cox Media Group or its sponsoring. Anything you hear may and will be used against you. Thank you. Voted as best local podcast in Tampa Bay by the Creative Loafing. You're listening to Happy Hour. Are you feeling classy today? Sit down, pour a glass of wine, and listen to Happy Hour. You're tuned in to Happy Hour, an hour where Happy rants about something. Sit back and listen in. Happy Hour is on now. Happy Hour is on now. What up? What is happening? This is Happy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And on the phone line, he is the host in the afternoons on 98 Rock in Baltimore. Kirk McEwen is on the phone line. What's up, dude? Brother, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Hoppy. Uh, somebody said, I said, man, I'm going to be on Hoppy, on Hoppy Hour. And somebody said, bro, he is a hustler. And uh, I listen to some shows, and a lot of your viewpoints are dead on. I, I totally get where you're coming from, and I'm just happy that you uh, shot me a call and, and had me on one of the hottest podcasts in America right now. <laughs> Damn right. I mean, I've actually known about you since you were on 105.7 Free FM, because what happened was we had 105.9 Free FM in Chicago, and we all know that that format was a bust. But I would look around at different free FMs, and I found it when it was Kirk and Mark. So I would listen to your podcast when I would go to the library. So I've been a big fan. I appreciate that, Ryan. I, uh, you know, I got my start at 98 Rock in 1984. Yeah. I did uh, part time for two years, and I got full time, and I was doing seven to midnight, uh, and then I left and went to DC 101. And worked over there. Grease Man worked in the morning. I worked at night. One's crazy in the morning. One's wild at night. <laughs> so it was me and Nino Grease Manelli, and I was only there for three years. And then I went back to 98 Rock and worked uh, there from 93 to 2006. And once I stepped off, uh, I jumped into the blender. And I went from uh, you know, HFS, which was free FM. It's funny. I worked at HFS up in Maryland. Yeah. And I worked at HFS down in Florida. But uh, CVS liked those call letters, and they parked them in Baltimore, and then they went ahead and let CBS and Tampa take it. But I went from uh, 105.7 The Fan or 105.7 WHFS. I went to Ocean City, Maryland for three or four months because I had to get out of the metro area yeah. uh, because of the non-compete. And then it was 105.9 The Edge in D.C. And then uh, I got the call to come down to Tampa, and I love it in Tampa. Uh, it was great, but... Uh, Beasley got the station. They came in and looked around at their at the cluster, and the sports station was the least performing. So, schwabam, got hacked off at the knees. But yeah, I love it. I love it, Tampa. I had a great time. So let's talk about your time at ninety eight Rock. How did you get your foot in the door as you were the nighttime host? Well, I was nineteen years old. Uh, I'm fifty now. When I started, uh, I was nineteen and. Uh, my brother, Mark, who did the weather on CBS nationally for 16 years, he was an anchor on CBS this morning. But when he started out, he started out at uh, WKTK in Baltimore, and his boss was Chuck DeCody. And then Chuck DeCody left KTK and went over to 98 Rock, and they were looking for a part-timer. I was looking for an internship. And uh, he said, your tape's good enough. You know, uh, we just let a guy go. Uh, you can do uh, part time, you know. So I was on Friday night, which was Saturday morning, from two to eight a.m. Yeah. And then I was on Saturday night, midnight to five thirty. Uh, and then I got full time when I was twenty one, and uh, I was singing along to the songs, and I was rowdy. I was. Uh, I'm just like. Uh, I'll rush the stage, man. I, I want to get backstage. I want to. I want to do everything that the guy who's going to the concert wants to do. And so, and I'm still the same way. So that really helped me out uh, in my quest to be a rock jock. I mean, they could feel the passion. Um, and so, yeah, I got into 98 Rock in 84, and uh, I, I was beating the night guy in D.C. from Baltimore. And if you know anything about the Mid-Atlantic, Baltimore and D.C. are close together. Um, there, there's like 35, 40 miles that separate the two. But if you put the two cities together, it's the fourth largest metro area in the nation. So D.C. knew what I was doing in Baltimore and vice versa. So the guy called me, young Dave Brown, and said, man, you're killing us from Baltimore. Would you think about coming down here? And so I went and worked at D.C. 101 with, with Grease Man for a while. And uh, after three years, I went back to 98 Rock and stayed there 
for 13 more years. And uh, yeah, 98 Rock it was my that was my home. That uh, and it, it is again. I got really lucky after Beasley chopped uh, 98 Seven the fan off. I got really lucky to be able to come back to this place I started. What is the fan base like since it's two major markets combined? What is it like for Washington, D.C. and Baltimore? How would you describe the fan base? Well, D.C. Uh, looks down their nose at Baltimore. D.C. is a little more affluent. It's more transient. you got people coming in from all over the country, um, you know, diplomats and senators and staffers that work in Congress. So, uh, and there's a lot of money. You look around at uh, Chevy Chase, Georgetown, Rockville, Arlington, Bethesda. I mean, that's coin. Baltimore, blue collar. If they like you in Baltimore, they love you in Baltimore. If they don't like you in Baltimore, they hate you in Baltimore. Uh, they look down their nose. Baltimore looks down on charlatans or carpetbaggers or people that they think are coming in and they're not part of Baltimore. That's why when I when you know every I've heard so much. Uh, Welcome back. You you are Baltimore. You are. This is where you belong. And and I get that. I mean, I've lived here uh, my whole life. But uh, I there I really enjoyed the opportunity to move down to the Gulf Coast of Florida and try and make a go of things. And you know, it's it's weird at forty six, forty seven years old to pick up and move a thousand miles away where everybody's like, I'm sorry, what's your name again? I mean, uh, I don't get that up here, but I got that down there and I was fine with that. I, but I just want to win. And, um, it, it's hard to, to do sports talk in Tampa because everybody a is from somebody somewhere else. And they've got their own football team and baseball team that they're rooting for instead of the rays, instead of the bucks, now the lightning kick ass, <laughs> everybody comes down there. And I, and I guess they might want to go see, the Chicago Blackhawks, but they're in the Lightning's building, and there's 19,000 strong in there every night. I got a strong appreciation for hockey after working with Chris Dingman for a year and a half, uh, you know, he enforcer for the Lightning and for the Avalanche, won two cups, and me being a brother from, from the Baltimore area, didn't really grow up watching a lot of hockey, not because I didn't like the game, but because there wasn't much opportunity. Uh, the Capitals came along at 74, and they were bad for years. Uh, they still haven't, you know, won a cup. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was tough to get a good, strong foothold in sports in Tampa, but I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm not sure what the initial question was. I just got off work, so I'm all fired up. So, What was it like when you found out that you were going to be doing the show Kirk, Mark, and Lopez? How did you find out that you would be doing mornings at 98 Rock? Well, uh, it was Bird, Mark and Lopez, and Bird, uh, spelled B-Y-R-D, Bird worked in Toronto, I think he worked in Vegas for a while, um, St. Louis, KC, he worked at some pretty, you know, pretty great call letters, now I believe he's in Chicago at a classic rock station, but Bird came and worked at 98 Rock, and they put him together, Lopez was at 98 Rock, six months after the station signed on in 1977. He was there until his death in 2005 from lung cancer. Lopez stopped smoking 25 years ago, or 25 years before his death, uh, and he died at 52 from, from fourth stage lung cancer. And one of the brightest guys I've ever known in my life, uh, just really smart, didn't know much about uh, music or sports, but everything else, politics, world you know geography uh, literature just a brilliant guy and uh, when he died uh the wheel sort of came off for mark and i anyway it was bird mark and lopez they weren't they weren't feeling it and so they said hey we're gonna have bird and kirk play a pool game whoever loses the pool game has to get up early that was their ruse for me to see if I had any chemistry with Mark and Lopez. So they acted like Bird and I played a pool game. I lost. So I have to get up and Bird gets to sleep in and do afternoons. And I have to get up early and do mornings. Well, we did have some chemistry. Uh, I remember talking to whoever Donna Dierico, maybe her name was, she was going out with Nikki six or somebody, maybe they got married. But uh, when I first started on the show, we had an interview set up with Donna Dierico and I was like, so uh, was there a prenup? And she paused. I'm like, no, oh, 
If you're pausing, <laughs> there got to be a prenup. And uh, Nikki Six called back, and he's all pissed off. And I knew we had something then because we're ruffling feathers, and uh, you know I could just feel something. So they put Bird in the afternoon after that, and I did mornings with Mark and Lopez. We were voted the best morning show in Baltimore in 2004 by Baltimore Magazine. Uh, we were always up for awards and R and R and. Um, you know, AOR, Rock Station Morning Show. I don't believe we ever won it, but we were always in the mix. So that's how I got on the morning show. And uh, after that, it was a it was a run of 10, 12 years. And Mark and I went across the street, to, uh, but they didn't really care about us much. And after they let us go across the street, that's when I jumped into the blender. And I just recently got out by going back to 98 Rock. What was it when you guys went to 105.7 Free FM? Why didn't they embrace your show like they did at 98 Rock? What happened there? Mm. I've thought a lot about that, Ryan. And what I can surmise is this. Uh, I think when they hired us away, they their motive really was to weaken 98 Rock and not so much strengthen Free FM. Uh, they didn't get our brand. They didn't really understand what it was we did. I'm not even sure if they listened to us before they hired us. But I would do it. I'm, I can get in the gutter. I'm tawdry, dirty. They were calling me Creepy Kirk at 98.7 a fan. Creepy? I just I think chicks are cool. And uh, I'm not afraid to say things that other people might be afraid to say. So uh, when I got over to 105.7, Free FM in Baltimore, uh, they they didn't get us like 98 Rock did. And so because we didn't have that long history with them, plus they were they changed the show the show that they got and the show that they kind of needed and manipulated and all that wasn't a good show. And so we weren't resonating, we didn't get traction, and so 18 months later I'm on the street. But I got paid for another year and got paid real well. But people start forgetting about you. You become irrelevant. So they, I think they hired us away to weaken 98 Rock. And we left 98 Rock with a full cupboard. So it didn't, it didn't weaken them. They just picked up with all of our guests, all of our benchmarks, and kept on rolling, doing everything that we did. And I don't even know if 98 Rock listeners knew we were gone uh, for a year and a half. Uh, we just got our ratings. You know, 90 Rock was, uh, has been 11 or 12 in the market for the last couple of years, and this last book we're number five. So, um, and for a rock station to be number five, and Baltimore's got a lot of homies. I mean, I'm a black guy. Baltimore is <laughs> packed with brothers, dude. And so it's the urban stations that do really well. And uh, 90 Rock, I mean, there's it's very blue collar, as I said before, but uh, it, it was harder – for a rock station, even or you look around the country, rock stations aren't usually in the top five. Um, but so we yeah we just got a book uh, yesterday and coming to come in at number five is pretty cool. So uh, long story longer, I think they hired us away to weaken the station, and they probably did. You know after people finally figured it out a couple of years later. How hard is it, like, once they get rid of you to have to sit out a year? Yeah, you're being paid, but you're not doing any radio. How hard is that, Kirk? It's easy for the first two or three weeks because uh, you get up at 4.30 in the morning and you've got um, kind of pent up your uh, fatigue. You know, you're tired and you, you, it's cool to, you know, instead of getting up at 3.30 to sleep till 6.00. You know, and yeah. uh, and then you know seven fifteen, and you get up and you you do whatever you want. You take a nap, you eat whatever. After two or three weeks, Hoppy, it's ugly. I'm so <laughs> I'm so hyper and need to be doing something. I'm a dick, you know. And you're walking around kicking rocks, staring at your shoes. It's the worst. And I've been off for thirty months since two thousand six. I worked. And then I'm off for eight months. And then I work for a year and a half or two years. And then I was off for 11 months. And that, you know, those periods of being off, I'm kind of used to it. You know, before I got the job uh, in early June, 
I figured it out better, but it's the worst. For somebody that likes to work, they say now having a job is a new raise. Uh, you know, I got a good offer from 98 Rock, and they didn't have to because I was desperate. I was on the street. You know, if you the best way to get a job is to have a job. I didn't have a job, but what I did have was – uh, recognition in the marketplace. People knew who I was. I have a high Q rating in the area. Uh, I love this. I love, look, I treat people good, man. Wherever I go, uh, I talk to people longer than I really have to. I don't do the turn and burn as soon as, hey, hey, Kirk, I listen to you all the time. Hey, thanks a lot. Pyrrhon. I don't do that, man. I'll be like, oh, really? Hey, what's your daughter's name? Hey, how old are you? That's great. Oh, my God. You know, my daughter's a bit, you know, I'll, I'll talk to people and I think, you can get it after a while. You feel, you feel me, you know. And so I got that here, and I didn't get, have a chance to really cultivate and and get that going in Tampa, and that really bothered me because I, I liked it down there. Everybody was cool to me, and damn, it's you wake up, brother, and you walk outside, and it's seventy five degrees, and it's like yeah, y'all. It's just you know, and now all the leaves and it's raining and cold and the leaves are on the ground and they're all yellow and orange, which is great. I like the change of seasons, but I like palm trees too, man. And, uh, egrets and seagulls and all that. So, uh, yeah, but sitting out awful, awful. It's, uh, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. So it's just so great to be working, man. They are working me like a dog and I'm like, no, I'm happy to have it. What do you think 98 Rock is doing so well for you guys to be doing so well in the ratings during each and every book to be in fifth place? Well, uh, you know what's funny is my old boss, uh, who put me together with Mark and Lopez back in 1996, he worked at 98 Rock from 1995 to maybe 2002. Yeah. And then he left. His name is Rick Strauss. Uh, and then he he went and worked for iHeartMedia, uh, I believe, and uh, and then he he got let go in a downsizing move. It's so funny, brother. In, in July of 2014, he said, "Hey, Kirk, uh, I need a a letter of recommendation. I've been let go." And I was like, "All right." I and I sat right down on LinkedIn and wrote him a great letter of recommendation. And uh, I'm not sure what happened, but he, after they let 90 Rock's program director go, he was rehired by 98 Rock. So he got the job in February. And um, when I got let go in December, there was a little period of time there where we were both not working. So um I had a friend working at 98 Rock tell me that Rick was going to get the job, and so I called him and I said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm not working at 98 Seven of the Fan anymore. I'd love to talk to you. He's so honest, he couldn't call me and say, hey, well, if I get something, I'll let you know. He knew he was going to get the job at 98 Rock, but he didn't want to talk to me because he knows he would probably let it out of the bag. So he didn't call me till the uh, move was announced. And I'm like, I just wrote a great letter for my old boss, and now he's – the boss at 98 rock again this could this could be good and then in march sarah fleischer who worked at 98 rock for 38 years she was on the original staff in 1977 when they turned the lights on at the station in june she stepped aside and that paved the way for me to come back to get to answer your question he took some of the heavier music out 98 rock had become really alternative metal avenge sevenfold and uh, you know, Chevelle and Incubus, and we still play those bands, but they were getting heavier rotation than yeah. they probably uh, needed. And so he's backed off of that. He's put some ZZ Top and some Cheap Trick and some classic stuff in that is palatable during the day. And the station has a great stationality. It sounds fun. It sounds hip. And uh, it's got great heritage in Baltimore. And I think a lot of people left the station for a while because they didn't like the direction of it. And now I think they're starting to realize that it's safe to come back. And I think that's why, Hey, look, one guy could have had a, a good people meter and like 98 rock. And that's why we went from uh, being in double digits to number five, or maybe there is a groundswell. We're going to find out in the next book or two. So, but yeah, I think Rick manipulating the music, 
bringing me back. Um, you know, I think a couple of those things were very helpful for the station. What are some of your favorite memories over the years working at 98 Rock during your first term? And now if you have any memories over the last few months? Well, uh, I just got to say, when I first started on the air, it was all Sarah's leaving, Sarah's retiring, Sarah's leaving, Kirk's back. You know, there wasn't a lot of hype for me coming back. And then when I got on the air, the phones went just crazy. And it's like, welcome back. I'd left the station uh, when you guys left years ago. And now I'm back. It's so great to hear you. Um, man, that that propped me up so big. Back in the old days, I mean, I can remember being on 98 Rock when I was just a baby broadcaster at 20 years old on the overnight. And I'm talking to some chick on the phone and I got the mic on and I'm like, yeah, go ahead, man. I got here. I was like fucking 10 minutes late today. And she's like, you know, you just said fuck on the radio. And I was like, what? And I looked down and the mic is on and up. I'm like, Oh God. And then <laughs> I called my boss the next day and I said, dude, I just said, fuck. I said, fuck on the air at two forty five in the morning. He's like, you're the first one to ever say the F word on the air. You're fine. One. And then one morning, a couple of years later, we have snow closings up here. And I grabbed the snow closing from Tuesday, and it's Wednesday at, Wednesday evening, and I'm giving Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County and all these kids off the next day where they I was reading the wrong snow closing. I got reamed out for that one. thought it was going to be the end of my career. Um, but they care about you at 98 Rock. It's, it's owned by uh, the Hearst Corporation. They have two radio stations, and they're both in the building that I'm in, WBALAM. They have WBAL Television, which is an NBC affiliate, and 98 Rock. They had KDKA in Pittsburgh. They had a bunch of stations all over the country. They sold them all off. They have uh, Good Housekeeping and Cosmopolitan, Field and Stream, a bunch of TV stations, newspapers, and two two radio stations. So they care about me, uh, and that's why I got a chance. This is my third time working at 98 Rock. I worked there 84 to 90. And then I went to DC 101. I worked there from 93 to 2006. And then I went across the street to 1057. And now here I am in 2015, back again. So uh, I tell you, I always thought, man, I got to get to New York. I got to get to LA. I got to get to Chicago. Before I signed with 98 Rock, I had an audition at KLOS out in Los Angeles. And um, it, you know, that's when Baltimore was rioting and the brothers were burning down the CVS and stuff. I'm like, I can't leave this. It's going to look like I'm trying to jump off because of all the unrest. I knew that, and I needed to do something. Now, I was going to be a big brother or something, but I'm like, I go down there in the city. I get plucked. I got my own kids, you know? So, you know, you cross that off the bucket list. I ain't going to be nobody's big brother down there, but it's great. It's great working back at the station that I got my sea legs. How nerve-wracking was that time back in May? Because I was nervous just watching it on CNN. Like, what's it like when Baltimore is just becoming a war zone, dude? It was embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. It was embarrassing to to see all these brothers throwing rocks at the cops and, you know, uh, making a line and standing up against guys with arm, you know, they they got all their armor on and the big shields and everything, and it just looked terrible nationally and internationally you know and um uh it was it was it was terrible i've i don't you know i don't know if i've ever seen anything like that uh in this area and you you know you see it in you see it in places like syria or uh yeah. you know when reginald denny or whatever was pulled out of his truck in la and and beaten after the oj stuff and you know but to see them run into a store that I'd been in a bunch of times and burn that bitch down, that CVS burned like it was that firewood in there. It was crazy. And that went on for, I mean, every day you'd wake up and you'd wonder what the next day would bring. Um, look, Freddie Gray wasn't Mother Teresa's boy. I mean, Freddie Gray was into some shady stuff. Should he have died the way he died? No. But you, you could just feel it. I mean, around the country with Ferguson, and then a cop shoots a guy in South Carolina running away from him. And then so then you see this, and Baltimore, 
You know, Ferguson was elementary school as compared to Baltimore when they got into it. You know, they they went nuts and just burning stuff down, kids running across the street, all all of it being synced up by social media. Yeah. And then so you had the kids early and then the adults at night. And man, there was a church they were building that was all framed out with all the two by fours and everything. Poof, that bad boy went up, and it's 11 o'clock at night, and you see this huge fire and helicopters going around. And I'm like, this is awful. Somebody needs to get a grip on this thing. And finally it's mellowed out. But look, I'll tell you what, man. They're taking away rec centers in Baltimore and putting dog parks and stuff. You do that, and brother's going to grab your stuff. You know, you got to – you have to make it so people feel like they're – they're part of what's going on and they're part of the solution and not part of the problem. And, um, it was it right what they did. No, but I tell you what, it got everybody's attention. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope, I think things are getting better. I know that they're starting to listen to some of the gripes, but yeah, it was terrible hoppy to, to see your city burning. These people, they're, they're, the brothers are running in there and they're, taking all these pharmaceuticals. I mean, and there's been, I mean, everybody, there's Xanax all in the street down here. Yeah. Baltimore's always had a heroin problem, but it's really beautiful in the Inner Harbor if you come. <laughs> it's so funny because when everything was going on, ain't no problems in the Inner Harbor. I mean, because the Baltimore City Police, they know that's what everybody, that's where the tourists go. Now, you go eight blocks west or east or north, that's where stuff was going on, but not right downtown. That's like, you know, doing something downtown uh, in Tampa where they would, you know, where they would do, what's that, pirate? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but, yeah, the, the big festival. Oh, Gasparilla. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, so – you do something like that on Bayshore Boulevard or something, nah. You could, you could do. I saw on the news the other day, Tampa police are pulling over brothers on bikes. <laughs> you pulling the brothers over on bicycles. Don't you find it sad that when these things happen with bad cops, that then people are like f the cops, and then everyone gets mad at every single cop? Don't you find it ridiculous yeah. when because uh, of one incident, everyone then hates every cop? When yeah. I would say almost every cop is cool. Well, uh, I've never had any problems with cops. I I get nervous when a cop is behind me when I'm well, driving, yeah. but well, yeah, but uh, but not because I've been. I, and I was driving the other day trying to think: Have I been racially profiled? And there was one time uh, that I was, and that was when I was uh, a freshman in college, uh, and I'd come home for something, and a buddy of mine was doing some dumb stuff, and because I was a black guy in a predominantly white area, I got pulled into the situation. I'm like, well, that's wrong. And and we went to court, and the judge was like, son, you you can get out of here. You shouldn't even be here. And he got all up in the cop's ass. But, yeah, look, there are some cops that thrive on being all-powerful on the side of the road, and they're the judge and the jury and all that. But there's other cops out there that are stopping and they're changing tires and they're coming up on cars that they pull over, not knowing if they're going to get, you know, shot at. Yes, yeah. You go into to domestic situation where guys are like, oh, damn it, woman, I told you. You know, and the <laughs> cops got to go in there into that. And then the woman's like, no, I don't want to try to charge you. It's like, you've been bitching. Why'd you call? You know, <laughs> so I feel terrible. For, for cops that – and that's their job. That's their livelihood. They leave the house every day, and the woman they love and the kids that look up to their dad or their mom don't know if they're coming back that night. So, you know, and, and, and all these people that have all these problems, somebody comes into their house or somebody does them wrong, the first thing they do is call the cops. So there's such a weird, twisted dichotomy there. I hate it. Now, my favorite show of all time isn't The Sopranos, isn't The Simpsons. I love The Wire. How similar is that show to what Baltimore is? Straight up like it's not even written. Yeah. (laughs) It's like somebody stood on the corner. And there's areas. Don't get me wrong, Hoppy. I mean, there's areas that are bad. But in Baltimore, I mean, you go – uh, outside, you, you go to Baltimore County and you go out to uh, Reisterstown or um, Towson or some of these areas, and it's really affluent. It's horse country. It's it's dough. Michael Phelps swimming at the Baltimore North Baltimore Aquatic Club. I mean, it's that's part of Baltimore, but it's not right downtown. 
you go downtown where you got the brothers on the corner and they're like they're staring you down when you're driving because they're <laughs> trying to sell you something just like the wire just like homicide and i mean uh I, you know these shows come from a little bit of truth and then a little bit of embellishment but there's got to be some truth there Otherwise, they'd be doing the the wire at Cape Cod, but they're not. They're doing it in Baltimore because that's where it's going on. Baltimore's got a a nasty heroin problem, um, and and has for years, you know. And and it's not just the brothers. You got white white collar affluent dudes driving in to hook up with the brown. Yeah. Um. So it's uh it's it's terrible. Then you know it. it Oxycontin is expensive, and heroin's not, but does the same thing. Heroin's going to get you there quicker and stronger. I'm so glad I didn't mess with that stuff. You know, heroin is, to me, that's master's degree drug. You know what I mean? That's like, that's not like high school or gateway. That's through the gate, up the street, on the on the porch. You know, once you once you get involved in heroin, there's not a lot of good that can come. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're going to nothing's fun anymore you know you don't you don't all you're doing is trying to get to that next high yeah it's the worst any of you kids out there make sure you don't get involved in heroin yeah it seems like well weed's normal coke is bad but it seems like heroin and meth is where it's just like i'm done with life i want to do nothing anymore you know what i mean like you never go I want to do heroin so I can come up with good ideas. Like, it's just when you're done. You know? Yeah, meth makes you pull your face apart, and <laughs> nobody's doing a lot of creative stuff on heroin. It's like the guy from Glee who died. He looked like a yeah. straight-laced, clean-cut dude, and then he dies up in, uh, I guess, Vancouver or somewhere on a movie shoot in a hotel. It's such a uh, – it's you know you're hidden. You do it on your own. It's not like smoking a doobie at a concert and you're listening to Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and everybody's grooving to the beat. You know, heroin is you know it, it's methodical. You got to cook stuff up and tie stuff off, and so it's just ter- it's just nasty. If you got to if that's what you're if that's a good time, I feel bad for you. It's because it's not for long. It's a it's a terrible terrible way to to party as they say and coke is awful too dude and liquor's not much better you know marijuana makes you mellow out and that type of thing but i think liquor yeah. you know makes you bump into people out on the road and you know god damn it i told you shut up and no you shut up you know it's like good lord um yeah there's a lot wrong <laughs> there's a lot wrong with this country but it's the greatest greatest nation on earth and i love it yeah, dude, people think drinking is so normal. If you do it right, you can have fun getting drunk, but the true person in you comes out when you're drinking. So that's one of the biggest problems. You basically lose any common sense. So whatever is on your mind, you immediately do. Drinking is one of the underrated, dangerous parts of life. Wouldn't you agree? My college roommate would get up in the morning. We lived off campus. I went to the University of Maryland. We lived in what they called a Knox box, which was right off campus, right across the street from where Len Bias ingested all that blow. But uh, my, my roommate would get up in the morning, and he worked down for a congressman from Michigan. Um, he was a, a committee member for, you know, he would do errands for this congressman, but he'd get up every morning and drink a Budweiser, and then he'd get on the bus and go down to the city. And then he'd come home at night, and we'd drink Naughty Heads, which was like Seagram's Extra Dry, extra dry and Grapefruit Juice. It was all the, all the brothers drank down at the barbershop and stuff. We thought we were cool. He died, like, at 30-something, and I cried for three days. I mean, this is a dude I went to high school with. We were college uh you know, roommates, and and here he is. I'm 30. I stayed up for two days after he died. It was just, that's when I really felt mortality. Um, but yeah, dude, drinking is awful. My dad was an alcoholic. Would fall asleep in front of the door. Couldn't nobody could get in the front door. You know, I mean, he's sleeping right on the in the foyer by the front door. My dad's now 86 years old. He's in assisted living, and he stopped drinking years and years and years ago. But uh, I saw that and. I knew right then. I wonder why Dad's sleeping in the front door. <laughs> I was like, man, that's some good Johnny Walker. Um, but yeah, I just think it's such an insidious habit. Uh, you know, 
drinking has ruined so many lives, so many lives. Yeah, dude, it's one of those things where drinking is often where you drink at a bar or at a public place, and then the morons drive home. I don't know what it's like in Baltimore, but, dude, did you see here in Tampa Bay and St. Pete? I have never seen so many clear-cut drunk drivers in my life because I'll record happy hour now, like at 10 p.m. when we're doing it, or if I get off of my job at midnight, I'm here till 3 a.m. And that's when they are out, dude. I have never seen so many clear-cut drunk drivers. And it's like, why? Like, can't you just get an Uber? Like, you know how rude and yeah. inconsiderate it is to put your life and everyone else's at risk just because you have to get drunk? Do you know what I mean? Uh, Hob, I was... Going to work one morning, I lived in the countryside area of Clearwater, and the yeah. station was in St. Pete. So I didn't know uh, McMullen Booth at the time, and so I was taking 19 all the time. What a terrible road. So I'm on 19, and I'm going to work, and I'm, uh, I look at my rearview mirror. It's 4.15 in the morning. I look in the rearview mirror, and I see a car, one car, back about a quarter mile. And so I continue on, and I'm driving, and I'm looking at the – I'm looking at the windshield. I look up again just in time to see this bitch running into me at 100 miles per hour. She hit my car from the back, spun me around. I did a full 360 and then ran into the jersey wall. Both airbags came out. BMW assist comes on. Hello, Mr. McEwen. We see that you've uh, had an accident. Are you all right? I'm like, I'm fine. Uh, thank you. I got to see what's up. I get out. I walk down to this girl's car. She pulled over about a football field away. And she goes, she gets out of her car and goes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I was like, oh, somebody's been deep into the cups. So and then about five minutes later, police start getting there. She walks up. I'm talking to the paramedics. I see her flailing around, talking to the cops. They put the handcuffs on her, and she is in the paddy wagon. And in Florida, it's so great. They got like a TV show or whatever that puts all the drunk people or a magazine. You yeah. can pick up a magazine somewhere, and it'll, it ha it's, it's all drunk people that have gotten arrested. I'm like, there she is right there. But, yeah, I got – you're right. Late night, 4 in the morning, 3 in the morning, everybody coming home, no Uber, blasted off their ass. Um, and yeah, so I got firsthand and I made sure I hopped right on that gurney. I'm like, I am not driving myself to the hospital or I'm not going to sit in the front with the paramedic, tape my head down, put me on that thing. I want people to know I was in a, in an accident and I had to get, get massages and everything. But yeah, look, they could put the blow and go in your car when you get it new off the lot. But why would they do that? Because that would take money from the chiropractor the lawyer, the person that puts the yeah. bagpipes in your car, uh, everybody, everybody's getting paid. So let's keep things as they are. If they put the blow and go in your car right there when you're at, you know, you name it, uh, name the name the dealer, there's gonna be a lot less drinking. <laughs> and now I want to ask you this: Tampa Bay radio fans are so intense and so loyal. Did you ever get hate online? Because I feel like being on the radio in 2015 is so much different than when you were doing Kirk, Mark, and Lopez just because you guys didn't have social media back then. Because I've been right. wanting to ask you this. How much different is it now where anybody can say whatever the, the hell they want and just hide behind a keyboard like a pussy? Yeah, it's it's terrible. But you got to, just like you said, I mean, people can hide behind a keyboard and say what they want and then disappear back into the crowd. And you have to condition yourself for that. Um, I'm such a I, – I, I really uh, am attuned to criticism or negative. When people are like, dude, that was great, I appreciate it. Yeah. But I don't really listen to that that much because everything I do, I think – at this juncture should be at a certain level. But when I, and when, when I mess something up and people are on it and they're right, I really take from that. Now, if you want to come at me and say, you're an idiot, blah, 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 I don't really, I try not to let that creep in, but you're going to have people that have had a bad day and they, they know that they can get under your skin and they, and they do it. I think to me, it's cowardly and uh, it's just, you're a, you know, what are you doing? You know, that's like me 
finding out where you work and giving you a, a hard time yeah. about it. So you just kind of have to let it roll off your back. Um, but, yeah, that's something I didn't have to deal with before was Twitter and, and Facebook and people, you know, hey, uh, boy, don't worry, you don't you, you didn't suck that hard as you did today. Ha, 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 LOL. You know, you know it's like, <laughs> really? God. So, yeah, I and I would never do that to, to you know, drag somebody through the mud on social media. Uh, but other people... That that's their hey I pay your I pay your salary or you know people think they can say whatever they want to you how about athletes bro I mean you miss a pass but somebody's got you in their fantasy and now they're spitting venom at you because they lost twenty bucks yeah but you think the guy even knows that you had him in fantasy and you think that he tried to do that it's like come on people this the, the world is is a terrible place, man. <laughs> I remember thinking, I don't even know if I want to have kids. You got ISIS and uh, you got people drunk driving and pedophiles and Ugh. it's just, a, it's a mess. I noticed a lot of that in Florida, man. All the pedophiles want to live there because of the water parks and the amusement parks and sunshine and there's, you know, with all the sun comes drinking and fun and, you know, it's the, the, there's a you know it's just like the Twitter account Florida man. I mean there are the Florida man doing something dumb every single day. Yeah, dude. In the next town over, there was a girl that had sex with five different dogs that lived in her house, and it was <laughs> right by the Walmart that I go to. It was unreal. <laughs> I know where that apartment building is. It's so weird because that doesn't happen in the Midwest as often. As it happens here in Florida, dude, it's unreal. Do you think she uh, liked it missionary or doggy style? <laughs> I think when I read that tweet online, every single response was, it's a whole new meaning to doggy. I was like, oh, yeah. you guys are such comedians. <laughs> you know well, what I mean? It, it, you know, when I was living down there, it was like, you know, the woman who is prostituting her daughter yeah. or a guy who hid in the woods from the cops and got eaten by an alligator. It's so much dumb shit. It just cracks me up. So, um, but having said that, I enjoyed my time in Tampa and yeah. it, it's great. Cause when I come back, I know my way around, but, uh, it was, uh, it was an interesting two and a half years down there. And I made a lot of friends and, and had a great time. My buddy, Jesse cage is down there doing his podcast. He does a Fisher and cage podcast and, I do a podcast up here. If anybody wants to check it out, it's uh, Kirk McEwen podcast, and you can you know get it at kirkmcewen dot com or it's part of the Realm Network R E L M Network dot com. And uh, Don and Mike uh, used to uh, Don and Mike used to be a very good uh, afternoon show. They were syndicated nationally, and two of the guys that worked on that show were Lowell Melser and Mark Ronick, and they. Uh, split it off and started their own podcast network. And Buzz Burbank, who was Don and Mike's newsman, is part of my podcast. It's pretty good. We talk about everything just like you and play music and comedy. And um, it's it's a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm happy to be working and doing my podcast and, yeah. and just, you know, Talking about the one and six Ravens, even though they're one and six, bro. People are like, dude, you brought the losing back from Tampa. When I moved to Tampa, Baltimore won the Super Bowl. And then when I moved back to Baltimore, I thought the Lightning were going to win the cup, but they got close, but they didn't they didn't get it. Now I move back to Baltimore and Baltimore now sucks in football, but I think it's gonna be a quick short run. Uh one year, one and done. And the Bucks, man, it was tough talking about the Bucks every day because you look at their history, and most of their history has been futility. I mean, they won a Super Bowl, but good Lord, 18 or 20 of the years of their existence have been under 500, and that's tough. And it's just a weird vibe down here. Like, the Bucks fans are so passionate and so diehard, but what's weird is it's just because it's a transplant city. You have Bears fans, Giant fans. Eagle fans, you have every major market that's cold. They all move down here. Packer fans, Lion <laughs> fans. There's just so much of a mix of everybody from each, every part of this country that it's like there's no real culture down here. Do you notice that when you were here? 
Like the vibe yeah, is so it. mixed. Yeah. It's so different. Cause like I would assume up in Baltimore, it's all blue and in Chicago, it's all orange, but down here, it's a mix of things. Unless you go to a lightning game, it's just fascinating being in an area that's not passionate about just one team, you know? Well, the way I always put it was that in Green Bay, in Chicago, in Baltimore, in the wintertime, it's Ravens. And you don't have people moving from Kansas City, Missouri to Baltimore like you do people moving from Kansas City, Missouri to Tampa. So if you're in Baltimore, there, you can't go to the beach on Sundays in November like you can in Tampa. So people buy in, man. Football and and. Plus, this area, having the Colts up and move in the middle of the night in 1983, and this area had to go for 13 years without a football team. Look, Cleveland Browns left Cleveland to come to Baltimore. They had a team in three years. Baltimore's team left. They didn't get another team back for over a decade. So this area on Sundays where you had Johnny Unitas and Raymond Berry and Burt Jones and all these guys, you know, uh, Bubba Smith. I mean, you know, so Baltimore, it wasn't like they didn't have a football tradition. They were one of the cornerstones of the National Football League. And then their team, because of their drunk-ass owner, leaves because John Elway decides with the first pick, he's not going to go to this city. So the city loses their football team. So for 13 years, so now when it's time for football, dude, there's 71,000 people packed at M&T Bank Stadium. Even though they're one in six, people are still into it. But in Tampa, the Buccaneers have been, um, they haven't had, look, Greg Schiano was awful. He was a terrible coach. Toes on the line, diving at people's knees in the victory formation at the end of the game. The players didn't like it. Then they get Mercer in the locker room. You know how bad that was to talk. Yeah. It was just one nightmare after another when I was down there covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You don't have that up here. Uh, Bashadi runs a pretty, you know, besides Ray Rice, but you're going you're gonna to walk around. Look, Tampa had Aqib Tlaib and Michael, what's the guy's name, who, you know, had beds out on the front yard. Michael Williams, Johnson, Jack, I forget his name. He was a wide receiver. Um, but. Yeah, it's different in cities that are cold that you can't go to the beach in November and December like you can in Tampa. You're going to go to the football game. You're going to put your purple and black on, and you're going to go, ah, ah, ah. You're, going to be a, you're going to be all about the Ravens. So that's what you get in a city that uh, isn't as transient and everybody has to really buy in. And now before I let you go, I want to get your take on this. What is the future of radio? The future of radio is uh, shaky, dude. (laughs) I mean, with MP3s, my daughter listens to Spotify and Pandora. And, um, you know, when I came along, it was FM, AM, FM, uh, cassette, and then CDs came along. Um, But now with MP3s and streaming and Spotify, Pandora, it's, I, I don't know. Kids don't even listen to the radio much anymore. It's all, um, you know, it's not they they don't hop on the school bus and listen to music like we did. They you know you don't buy albums. It's all singles. You buy a single off iTunes. I'd go out and buy nine zero one two five by Yes, and I'd know every song because I listened to the album a damn million times. So I'm a little nervous, but I do think there is something about local, and when it snows or when there's a tragedy in your town, that's where radio is still meaningful, but you look at the numbers and they've really dropped off and they continue to drop off. And I wouldn't advise anybody to get into radio now. I just wouldn't. When I got in, if you were good, cream rises to the top, you know, and uh, being a black guy and rock and roll, I made sure I didn't get that big Baltimore O. Jesus Christ, Dara, hon, how about the O's? You know, and and that's one of those accents that once you hear it, you can't work anywhere else. You're you're Baltimore for life. And I didn't want I wanted to make sure that I was marketable in other areas, and uh, but I just feel like radio is a dying medium, and it's sad. Uh, it's sad. I love it. But yeah, it's, man. It's what I know how to do. It's weird because like when FM talk radio is done right. It works so well, like 102.5 The Bone, Real yeah. Radio 
and that's what annoys me so much about radio is it has so much potential if you get the advertisers down and you get people to believe in it. Because whenever I go to these events, talk radio like The Bone or even the show that you guys have in the morning, the 98 Rock Morning Show, it means so much to people because they hate their job, they don't like their life, and for five hours a show can make their day. To me, that's the only way that radio can survive. They need to realize that talk radio, edgy or fun radio, is what's going to keep it afloat. Because you have Spotify, you have Pandora, you have iHeart, you have all these different outlets. But talk radio and local radio, to me, is what's going to keep it afloat. It's personality driven. Yes. And, uh, if you if you can relate to your audience and they have a vested interest in what you're doing and they feel like they know you and they know your family and your history and things like that, then they come back. And you you can't get that from one song leading into another, leading into another. When you're in your car, yeah, and, and somebody is compelling. You know, I was very uh, – I admired 1025 The Bone when I was down there because – uh, I can I can riff with anybody. I can go on a bunch of different subjects. I can get dirty. I can uh, you know I can talk sports and I, I guy talk. I mean that's what I do and that's what 1025 the Bone was doing when I was down there. And I I didn't listen too much. I don't want any of their talk to creep into what I was trying to do. But I was well aware of uh, the genre and it, it, there's not a lot of uh, real raw radio like that. Uh, anywhere in the country. There might be a few outlets, but not like what they're doing at, at uh, 1025 The Bone. I, I admired the you know the model. It's sad because the reason it's not around is because everyone gets offended by words. When he's speaking his mind, when he's a yeah. quote-unquote shock jock. I'm so sick of that. It's like it can survive if people don't get offended by words. Because what I yeah. love is these losers that complain about these shock jocks are the same people that listen to it because they have nothing better to do with their day. So they want to get talented hosts fired or they want to make them say they're sorry just because they want to feel like they're a part of something. And here's yeah. my main point. If they're not really sorry, why do you want to hear them say that? That's what I love about when they say they're sorry. They're not really sorry. The companies were making them say they're sorry. Don't you agree? Totally. I mean, you had you had the guy at ninety two nine the game come out and talk about Mendoza, this woman, and call her Tits McGee, and say, <laughs> uh, "How do you? Oh yeah, hitting a softball. You really know about you know the the split fingered fastball." I was, I couldn't believe I'm reading this guy call this woman uh, who is an Olympian. Tits McGee. How can you type that at your keyboard and think that's cool? Yeah, right. I, I, I just don't get it. Uh, on my Twitter, I got think before send. Because one time I was at the beach. I'm in Tampa. And this was last, I guess it was last, uh, whatever the Daytona 500 is. I know it's right around uh, Valentine's Day. But we're at the beach. We're at Honeymoon Island or whatever. We come in the house. Jimmy Johnson's doing donuts. He's got the flag out the window in NASCAR. And I sit down, I'm tweeting out, way to go, Double J, two Daytona 500s in a row. And immediately people are like, hey, asshole, that was last year. There's a rain delay. And I felt like such an idiot because I didn't pay attention enough to it. So for somebody to sit down and know what they're writing, hey, Tits McGee, I'm like, it's like Kurt Schilling writing that. Muslims are like Nazis or whatever. You can't, if you work at ESPN or somewhere, that's not going to be okay. How do people not have a filter? And here's what I love is they think they're going to get away with that in 2015 on social media when things spread in a second. I just can't imagine him doing his prep and he's like, oh, they're going to love this tomorrow. Tits yeah. McGee. Like, that's so uncreative, too. What a great name. Tits McGee. How long did it yeah. take you to come up with that one? Shocking. Oh, boy. And so, you know, uh, I don't know, ma'am. Look, I try and I'm not perfect. Far from it. But I really, uh, I'm, I'm just in awe of radio and my job, and I don't want to mess it up. And, 
you know, I, I get off work and I might have a beer and then I go home because I don't want to, you know, I'm not in a position to be back in the old days, man. We all thought we were invincible when I was in my twenties and I was running the show doing, you know, afternoons at 98 rock and people are buying me drinks and then I'd stay up till four in the morning and go home and sleep a couple hours and go to the, I mean, now nah, forget that. I'm now, this is really important to me. Um, I'm surprised, you know, when I was all cavalier and younger that I didn't mess it up worse. <laughs> but now as I've matured a little bit and, you know, this is my livelihood and it means a lot to me and I'm just, I'm so grateful to have a job. You know, after after losing the job in Tampa, I wasn't sure what, what the next step was going to be and I, I got lucky to come back to my home. So it's all good, Hoppy. Where can people find your badass podcast, dude, and your work? Well, uh, if, if people want to hear me on the air, that's 3 to 7, Monday through Friday, and that's at 98online.com. There's a 98 Rock in Tampa and a 98 Rock in Baltimore. They are not affiliated or sister stations or anything like that. Hell, there's 97, 98, 96 Rocks all over the country. Uh, these just happen to be two 98 Rocks. Um, so, yeah, 98online.com. I'm on 3 to 7. I also do Ravens game day three hours before every Ravens uh, game. And uh, we have a nice setup out on what we call Ravens walk. Um, Ray Lewis is supposed to drop by. They're doing legends of the game uh, this year since the Ravens have been around for 20 years. The Ravens have been around 20 years, and they have two Super Bowl trophies. Oakland Raiders have been around for 50-some years, and they have three Super Bowl trophies. And they all talk about commitment to excellence and just win, baby. Really? Really? You've been around all that time. You only have one more trophy than the Ravens, who've been around thirty less years than you. So it's a great, it's a great organization. I'm very happy to be affiliated with the Ravens. So that, there's that, and then the podcast is at uh, realmnetwork.com, R E L M, or Kirk McEwen. That's K I R K M C E W E N dot com. And hey, I got a lot of friends still down there. My buddy, you know. Jesse Cage, as I've said, and Sven, Stefan Anderson, and Jerry P. Tuck, and, you know, Dinger, and just a lot of great people that are still in the area. Roxanne Wilder, uh, Special Ed. I met a lot of great people down there, and I'm better for it, uh, for having worked down there for two and a half years. It's a, it's a good town. Not a great sports town, but a very good town. Well, man, thank you so much for coming on Hoppy Hour, dude. This was a lot of fun, Kirk. Well, I uh, I love your point of view on things, man. You're you're spot on, and uh, you're not afraid to talk about what you feel is right and people that are doing wrong. And you know, I think you got a bright future, and they're lucky to have you down there. And there's a reason why you're one of the best podcasts in the Tampa Bay area. Keep it up, Ryan. I'm you know glad to, glad to have had a chance to talk with you and be on your show. Hell yeah, man! Thanks, Kirk. Thank you, Hoppy Band. Continued success. Talk soon. All right. Sounds good. Peace out. See you, buddy. And that was Kirk McEwen of 98 Rock in Tampa Bay in Baltimore as he called into Hoppy Hour. I was a radio geek 10 years ago who would go to the library after school and look up podcasts, look up shows. I was always intrigued by the free FM format because I love that type of talk radio. And I remember I looked up the free FM format in Baltimore and I found the Kirk and Mark show and I was immediately intrigued by it. So to have Kirk McEwen on my podcast 10 years later is so surreal. It's so unreal. It's just, it meant a lot to me. So shout out to Kirk for coming on happy hour. You can download my app. It's not hard. Go to the Google play or the iPhone shop and search up happy radio you can go to my website, hoppyradio.com, and tweet at me, at Ryan Hoppy Radio. Send me an email, ryan at hoppyradio.com, and support Hoppy Hour and Soli's Graphics out of Duluth, Minnesota, by going to tinyurl.com slash hoppyhourdecals. For just two bucks, you can support this podcast and much more. This has been Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, saying peace out. Happy hour. Happy hour. This is an official broadcast of Hoppy Radio. For more info, check out hoppyradio.com and hoppysworld.com.